Good. <clears throat> good, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, Wellington Branch, Karim Dickey, for co host uh, this uh, evening uh, seminar. Uh, to have Emil, uh, uh, he's a research fellow of the And he's currently doing a PhD at ANG. Quite impressed in your article, Emir. It quite very much a close neighbor to New Zealand, not but closer in Australia. And uh, it's a lot of interesting thing to say about Indonesia, about its democracy. And uh, I don't uh, I want to do it something more than that because <coughs> the fly we send out. And then for this session, Karim will do the chairing and then he will do the, the question and answer and, and close the meeting. Uh, without further ado, Emir, the floor is yours. Right, thank you very much for it. Can you guys hear me? Am I clear? Yep. yep. Very good. So I just want to thank the organizer for inviting me. And I just want to acknowledge even what happened uh, on the weekend and say my condolences. And hopefully my talk about tragedy in Indonesia makes you feel better about the tragedy happened this weekend when all black. Uh, all right, I think before I start with my um, discussing about the, 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 the concept of tragedy of Indonesian democracy, perhaps I can give a little bit of background about why I uh, write this article, right? Why, what, 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 what I was thinking about it. I was in Jakarta in uh, March and April, and that was when the big protest happened. And for, for those who are familiar with Indonesian, uh, the way Indonesian protest. Protest is actually a natural part in Indonesia politics. And it has been uh, quite important expression, especially since the independence in 1945, right? And there's always this indigenous and innate tendency for Indonesia to rise up against hegemony, especially because of this diversity of identity and diversity of idea. And therefore, there is this innate tendency in Indonesia to be unwilling to accept hegemony of certain or imposition of certain expressions of identities, right? But what was concerning was this frequency of protests that had happened under uh, Joko Widodo presidency from 2014 to right now, 2022. There, there have been uh, a few national, which mean quite huge, where student bodies and uh, rise up and organize themselves to protest against certain agendas. And the latest one was against the uh, motion to extend the presidential term from two to, to basically three terms. And, uh, this was what, what concerning and because there was a real possibility that it could happen if Jokowi wanted to. He has amassed quite huge uh, political power and is unopposed. Uh, right now, um, seven out of nine political parties, political party factions in the House of Representatives in Indonesia are member of ruling coalition which control 81% um, of the coalitions, but not just um, number of the, this percentage, right? But it is also the way he has able to align himself with different political power in Indonesia, with the police, with the military. So had he wished to push forward, he actually had the political machineries to do so. And that was why the, the student protest was really concerning, right? That was why the protest happened in the first place and in national scale. 
but there was this interesting um, restraint that he expressed so far, at least. And he is unwilling to, to break the stability and tarnish his legacy because he wanted to cement his legacy as a builder, not a breaker. So right now he is, you know, leaving it slightly up in the air and express assurance or reassurance in order to make sure that his legacy building ag agenda remain intact. But um, what what I was where I, you know how I approach these issues is thinking about these notions of circularity in Indonesian democracy, right? I am right now writing a series of uh, social observations, more of a political anthropology piece and hoping to develop it into some sort of anthology. But in this part, in this article, because this talk is based on an article that I am, uh, pub that I've published with the new mandala of the same name. And in this article particularly, I am discussing this concept of agency in, um, in, in, in Indonesian politics, because when that protest happened, there were a lot of commentaries, and a lot of these commentaries often ignore the political, um, the, the political environment Jokowi operated in. And I was just trying to take into account and try to evaluate, okay, to what extent we can put this blame on Jacob, right? And that's why this concept of agency started um, uh, to, to, to rise up. And when we talk about tragedy, tragedy is a circumstance that is difficult to recognize, right? And in this case, uh, I was looking at this circumstance where a, the democracy, corrupted agency person, because I, I saw Jokowi when I voted for him in, in 2014 as these promising politicians, right? But I also witnessed over time how the system forced him to, uh, to you know, become the system or part of the system and how then he harnessed that system into his uh, political benefit and then the society relied a lot on Pamuda or student. So Pamuda is this term that is quite traditional in Indonesia. It is basically um, this uh, traditional agent comprises of young people, youth, student, intellectuals, and has this his history to rise up against um, authoritarian tendency or hegemony. So society have been quite reliant on Pamuda to check Jokowi, especially because the opposition rendered importance by, uh, by, by Jokowi, right? But yet people keep electing or allowing and enabling Jokowi to have, or a leader to have this despotic behavior, right? So there is this circularity where, where in, in Indonesian democracy that is that I saw as some sort of tragedy because this kid, becoming a recurring theme. And uh, to be fair with Indonesia, each nation have their own tragedy. And let's face it, across the world, democracy has suffered quite a lot of uh, regression, right? We, we, we just witnessed Supreme Court of the United States overturning 50 years of precedent and how these institutions that were built to protect democracy undermine the majority the feeling of the majority and basically become that tool of a uh, minority to, to exert themselves, right? Which is their very own tragedy, right? And the reason why I put that in mind, put that there was because to contextualize how each nation is grappling with their own difficult tragedy. And obviously right now uh, in, what, what, ha what happened in Indonesia is both unique, but also universally shared. It is unique because uh, it interacted with the way Indonesian collectively experience and think about leadership, right? But it is also universally shared in the sense that it is the story of how democracy is trying to battle this deterministic trap uh, in Indonesia, it is about this trap of, you know, political expediency and 
also this very concept of legitimacy that often legitimize undemocratic means to achieve their goal. Now, uh, let me just briefly talk about uh, Macbeth, why I chose Macbeth, right? Why? And obviously, um, Macbeth grappled uh, with that very question of agency. And that's why it was so appealing to me just to think about it from that, that lens. And we saw as an audience how Macbeth put a dagger in Chivanka, right? We know for a fact that he killed that king to become king of Scotland. But then the question of culpability is not straightforward. You can assume diminished responsibility if you can argue that you have no agency for your actions. Like a soldier in the field, right? When they committed something, they could blame it on the chain of command. They could blame it on the higher ups. They can argue that, well, this is an error in political system, right? They have no choice other than to execute that very act. And Macbeth could, quote unquote, claim that diminished responsibility. And my piece was trying to apply that, that kind of thinking or, or rational thinking into the Indonesian democracy. Because sure, we saw Jokowi produce you know, policy and act that eventually abolished this concept of balance and you know, killed the Indonesian democracy. It's a very public act that we all witnessed. But was he really to blame? For, for that act, or was he like forces by or entrapped by the system he is operating under, right? So that, that's why this concept of agency become interesting for me because I was trying to evaluate and unpack that, that, that dilemma and to what extent we can argue that Jokowi is capable, not complicit. And obviously when we talk about Indonesian democracy, uh, and this notion of kingship, you know, is also quite interesting because it is very cultural. It is very cultural for Indonesian to think of the leader as a king. We have been habituated 30 years under Suharto from 63 to 98 to look at a king and the way they exercise control like a king. You know, like a leader has to have this divine life and has to be obeyed like a candle. And when Jokowi you know, campaign and rose to power. There was that endeavor to have this meek making uh, narrative. Uh, you know, he is the Satriya Pinyingit or the chosen one in Japanese lore. And when we think about that, it's not just about political rhetoric or narrative. It is actually deeper because it is related to these two uh, interrelated concepts about how Indonesia collectively understand leadership what it means to be a legitimate leaders, and obviously the desire to be led by them. And also this very concept of exercise of power, right? And also this, which carry with them acceptable limits of behavior that in Indonesia, apparently rather expansive, paternalistic and undemocratic. So I just want to set that up uh, to, to make the, the, the point of the piece, right? Now, um, let me, go to this journey to right now, to uh, th 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 this moment when the police is basically unopposed uh, in, in, in national stage. And it, it, it began in this, in 2004, obviously, when he was campaigning as a president. And this is when Jokowi's story really like somehow fit with Macbeth, because like Macbeth, Jokowi is a, is a person who, who quote unquote refused to stay in his outer place, right? There is no indication in his, in his, in his background that he could be a president. He's not from the military. He's not coming from like this dynastic background like Megawati's politics, right? He's not a career bureaucrat. So he's, he is untraditional president, right? And that's why he's appealing. But what's, what, what people forget is when we, when we look at the story of this rise, this, these two relationships between Jokowi and the elites who quote unquote made him or made his persona at the time. And also Jokowi relationship with the society that basically validated his need, his quote unquote undemocratic needs at the time. With regards to elite, it was very important to understand that 
his rise was fairly quick. It was not based on this tangible experience that he can show at the time, right? So it was basically based on this very public campaign, and he needed that political machinations from the elite. So he really tapped into the established elite to establish himself and win the Jakarta governor uh, uh, to be the Jakarta governor, right? And when he became a Jakarta governor, that was the time when he tried to establish himself in national political theater. But because he, he is only uh, there for a short period of time, uh, he couldn't have made you know, a tangible policy. He needed that theatricality and that, that, that expression to convince people the kind of leader he would become when he become a president, right? especially when you have an eye to the next job. You don't really care about your, your making a meaningful change that tied you to the job, right? And that's where, where he was, right? He was a fracas that was created. But then what was really interesting is how he could appeal and he could offer something to the Indonesian society, which is this promise of leadership. And when, when I think about it, because I also voted for him at the time, right? He liked to came to uh, the governor office or, or, or the bureaucrats uh, office, and then basically getting really, really angry to people and undermine this bureaucracy, right? And he liked to up upload his anger in social media. And obviously this, this could be seen as a flagrant undermining of his own people because he was the, 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 the governor, right? He could have reformed them, but he chose to undermine them in front of the public. And I think at the time, because we, we were just coming from Susilo Bamangi Duyono, which was seen as a lame duck, you know, a very non-reform-minded, don't want to shake the ball kind of president, that kind of undermining of your own people become very, very appealing. And that's why he became popular. But this vote that, that I casted and a lot of people casted validated his needs, right? It was validating his undemocratic needs, that it was actually a popular thing to do. There was a mandate for him to undermine his own bureaucracy. And this, is, this should be the frame that we use to understand why he continued to do that today, right? And when he, during the period of power consolidation, which is around 2014 to 2017, he is forced to play this game, right? This angle of assertions and acquiescence, right? There is certain submissions that he is uh, basically needed to afford to the coalition and the ruling party, the PDIP, the Democratic Party struggle, especially with the uh, chief patron of the PDIP, uh, Megawati Swarovski, right? He allowed the, 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 the ruling coalition to dictate quite a lot from his running mate to his uh, ministerial appointment to quite a lot of, of his governing style. But this is when things get interesting because he is also quite savvy and he started installing and he started uh, aligning himself with one of the most powerful forces in Indonesia, which is the Indonesian military. And he installed quite a lot of uh, former military officials and started, you know, at, at the time, not yet interfering, but associating himself, affiliating himself with military politics. Two of the most important people that I can mention would be Gatot Nurmantio, which I equate as Bangku in my piece, and also Luhut Panjaita. And Normandia was an interesting story because his appointment as the TNI chief, the Indonesian military commander, was essentially breaking this rotational pattern uh, that's supposed to alternate between office. So after army, you are not supposed to install another army. But Jokowi knew, he knew that he needed the army general because army carried political flag. So he broke that. Uh, appointment and install Gatot. And Gatot did become his first ally that established quite a lot. Because in Indonesia, we have a shadow uh, structure called regional commands. 
he used this regional format to launch a lot of his early national initiatives, like food self sufficiency initiative, and basically to pressure the uh, the local government, especially to to act faster, right? So. He, this is a reminiscing in his Jakarta time, right? Because he undermined the existing democracy. He used structure that could be more efficient, be it it's a military that is not supposed to play politics, right? And he make it basically, uh, he use it for his political expediency and, and tools. And obviously uh, it, it ended quite sour because 2017, Gatot Nurmantio started you know, indicating some sort of political willingness to go against the police. So he replaced him with the police, right? And another uh, interesting example would be uh, Luhut Panjaitan, which uh, is a relationship really worth noting because it's, it's still continue right now. And the police have, right now has installed him to be this super minister, right? Minister with an overarching, um, but as, a, as an analyst and as a you know analyst of Indonesian politics, what's really interesting with this is Luhut Panjaitan. He is a, a former former special forces general, and in, in his early day, um, he was there to basically impose discipline, right, establish harmony, and basically become the police political. Uh, the right hand man, basically. But right now, Luhut has essentially become Jokowi's double. A lot of people sometimes regarded him as a more president than the Jokowi himself because he is Jokowi international spokesman. He is the one who made deal domestically, right? And th that was when a lot of these questions about agency, like was he um, the president? And the way Jokowi controlled Luhut also quite interesting because this is when his own coalition became important. The coalition that he needed to balance become one of the balancing tools to balance Luhut. And all these things teaches us quite interesting story about how a leader like Jokowi consolidated power by surrounding himself with these established forces and playing them off of each other. Uh, and I think that was one of the um, important thing that, that, that we could take away, but also as he is able to carve room for himself and, and gain or regain that agency, this is also the moment when Jokowi no longer just completes it, but also culpable, right? Because he become the political operator that a lot of people uh, question him to do. And <clears throat> moving on to the, 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 the more contemporary period from 2017 and 2019, we can see how the police started exercising his power, anointing, like I said in my piece, right? Hadi, Hadi Cahyanto, this guy who by rights has no experience or traditional more at least to become the Indonesian military chief. And, but he, he sent a message that he can actually insult someone that, that is not traditional to be the, 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 the commander of military uh, because he is now a powerful figure, right? So there is that kind of national gesture. And obviously there's another like disbanding the Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia, like these institutions uh, to, to basically show he's able to harass uh, his uh, oppositions uh, or opponents to uh, with, with what we call robbery law or law that are unclear. And, after 2019, this is when things get even more interesting because after his re-election, what was surprising to people was he brought Prabowo Subianto, his own opponent, into his camp. And if you think about it, there was no need for him to do that because he is still the, the majority. You know, he still could uh, do things quite easily without uh, making this bargain or offering this defense minister positions to Prabowo Subianto. But this is also what we need to understand about the, the conceptions of order in, uh, at least for Japanese uh, leader, right? Because to achieve this harmonious order, it's insufficient to be a majority. You need to eliminate this 
accept completely. And that's what he's offering, right? And he is bringing uh, Prabowo into his own, uh, uh, and offering the defense minister, which is very important for Prabowo, which was basically, Prabowo was deemed by the West as a perpetrator of human rights abuse. And when you have a position like a defense minister of Indonesia, countries in the West were forced to entertain him. Right? It's not like you can say no to a meeting with Indonesian defense minister, especially in the changing region right now where Indonesia becomes quite important in, 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 in this region. Right? So Jokowi is offering quite a lot to Prabowo. In, an, in exchange, Prabowo basically stay out and allow uh, someone like Luhut to dictate quite a lot of national policy, right? Like be more benign with China, for example, be less critical of uh, Jokowi. And, and this is where uh, we are right now. We are in the positions where the government has no quote unquote effective opposition other than Pemuda. We can talk later in the uh, Q&A about, you know, his legacy building, uh, which is what he is, where he is right now, to 2024, but I want to end my remarks with just discussing Pemuda or the youth, because I think um, um, with, with Pemuda, it, it movement, right, or this desire, not necessarily for democracy per se, but anti-hegemony, uh, indigenous forces anti-hegemony, it does a short as of this uh, desire to remain, to be, to remain democratic, to remain, you know, opposed to one single idea in Indonesia. But then there, there is also a lot of movement from the government trying to restrict this, uh, the power of Bermuda, for example, controlling or interfering with campus politics, and then making it more difficult for them to critique the president in social media for example, or right now, the interesting uh, question would be the impact of moving the capital, because during the Soharto period, he was so annoyed with the protest by Pomula, he moved the campus outside the house, right? But right now, what Jokowi is trying to do is he's trying to move the capital altogether to the place that is quite inaccessible for, for people to protest. And it would be quite interesting, obviously, to, to see how he could accommodate that. Uh, uh, I guess I can end my remark there and we can have a Q&A about uh, some of the things that I mentioned or things that you already talked about. Right, Kai, I, I, I think uh, over to you. Thank you, Amir. A really interesting talk. So we're now uh, at the Q&A time. So if you've got any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or uh, you're also welcome to uh, raise your hand and you can ask a question. It's an open meeting and uh, all questions are welcome. So uh, if, I'll just have a look if there are any in the chat at the moment. I don't think there are. I guess I'll, I'll start and people can think and uh, put a question forward. If we go to Macbeth and you have the witches coming together to uh, prophesize about the future of Indonesia. And I wonder about, uh, you know, is democracy strong? Do you feel, because it's been quite a new experiment for Indonesia, you know, 1998, when that journey started, do you see uh, there being a, a time in which Indonesia falls back or do you feel like they'll keep kind of building on what's there? Right, and I think this is a really interesting question because when you ask Indonesians about this, they will always answer that we have a very different concept of democracy. And they, they would say that we are a democracy, but we are not going to be like a Western democracy. In that sense, I think what they said was that there is always this desire for, you know, anti-hegemonism that are very ingrained in Indonesia. And, uh, even since the 45, right, for example, uh, in the art movement um, in 45, when they were like dictating people to only paint in a Javanese, in an Indonesian style, they were like, well, if you want to paint Western style, we're going to paint Western style. So there is always that kind of unwillingness to be told, which, which, which make it very difficult for certain or one particular uh, authoritarian or big government tendency to really prevail, 
right? And 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 this is the the, the, the most resilient group. Of them. But then people do have that tendency, you know, not only for freedom but also desire to be led. And because the uh, their concept of leadership, I really like quite a lot, and the thirty years of experience under Suharto, which you know, legit some which leverages quite a lot of undemocratic means. They don't necessarily see undemocratic means to be contradictory with the goal of democracy. And this is, this is the problem because we don't necessarily have, because we are fairly new, we don't necessarily have other experience that show that leaders could be, you know, could, not, could achieve national agenda without you know, uh, authoritarian means. And I think that that, that kind of mentality that is, very difficult. So all the democracy would remain to continue. It, it, it's also like not the way, um, you know, we, we hope to be, you know, the one that basically achieve goal by taking into account, uh, you know, these different people without sidestepping the democracy, you know? Uh, I think that, that's, that, that's uh, that would be my answer. Thank you for that. And we've got a few questions uh, that have come through. So Kathleen here, great talk. She's asked if you could elaborate more on the association with military and the implications of that, such as unusual alliance, too much crossover within branches of government, etc., and how that could affect democracy. Right. Yeah, the questions of military is always interesting because it has been quite traditional in Indonesia. And they, they see it almost like as a part of, you know, life. That's just the, the way we operate, right? And uh, I think in the, in the early period, what was shocking was the, the extent to which Jokowi uh, leveraged them. And I guess it was, when we think about it, it wasn't shocking because it was also a reflection of his position at the time uh, as a weak, quote unquote, weak president was, who has yet to, Consolidated his power, and that and that explains the extent to which he made uh, affiliation or association with the military. And there are different forms of expression of this, uh, ranging from you know affiliating or installing the um, former elites, former military elites like Gatot Nurmantio, and then uh, Lut Panjaitan, for example. Right? But this is not the only name. Like right now, Prabowo Subianto. For example, or those who are not necessarily in uh, the the, uh, the 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 cabinet, but 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 are still quite influential, like Hendro Priono, for example, who, who was able to uh, put forward his, his uh, in law to be the current commander uh, of the military. For example, right? So there is that kind of at one point uh, uh, the way he. You know, I feel, uh, the way he associated with Indonesian military, but then the other part of it is also to really mobilize them for national agenda. And there, there is this uh, when he mobilized them, for example, for food self sufficiency, right? This military, he, he also allowed this military to supervise local uh, politicians and gain money. From uh, in the process as well, right? Because as you mobilize them, you need to give them. And that is also his way to, to do it. And, and military politics could obviously um, have this uh, interesting effect on democracy because there is a time when we need them, but there's also a time when, when we rely a lot on them. It creates this several things. One is obviously civilian de dependency on them. Two is ba uh, basically when when you because they are designed for to, uh, for war, right? They, they they will justify quite a lot of things in order to achieve goal. For example, harassing or intimidating civilian is one one thing that is often happened, right? And they are everywhere. They are in the uh, train station. They are in the uh, you know paddy field. And when when you have that kind of pervasive thing. You are basically creating this dependency instead of empowering civilians, and and on, in the long run, I think that that what would underline democracy itself. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's clear, Kathleen. I can elaborate a bit more if you have a bit more specific 
question on this. Um, Thank you. And we've got a question from Jan, and she's asked if you could elaborate on the relationship with the media. Right, because media in Indonesia tends to be, they are not directly affiliated, but they are affiliated with uh, certain political parties, right? And uh, at least in the first term, there is that kind of uh, preference. People can choose which media. Uh, I'm talking about traditional media. They can they can pick a channel and they can get what they want, basically. But now, with as there is no opposition, right? Uh, obviously, it also eliminates the kind of diversity of uh, opinion in, in in traditional media. I guess that's how to do it. And a lot of people right now rely quite a lot on. Uh, social media, which can be quite um, difficult things to navigate, right? And there is still a diversity of opinion in social media, but the OE is actually quite savvy in uh, making sure that he has an army of people balancing opinion. So there is that kind of hegemony in, in uh, media as well, especially right now he's trying to harass uh, since 2017, I think, since the uh, regional elections, uh, when people criticize the president in social media, they could be harassed, right? And so it created this chilling effect. Um, if you are a government uh, related or you are employed by the government, you could lose your position, basically. And that creates chilling effect and, you know, this, this kind of difficult to navigate media landscape because now we abolish some sort of diversity of opinion in, in the media, but, but also, you know, restrain to a degree um, the ability for people to express their opinion in social media. Obviously, it is quite difficult in Indonesia to do that because you are dealing with 250 million people with their own opinion. And a lot of people still, um, including what I'm doing right now, right, because I, I was uh, so worried about expressing my opinion so freely, especially because it's quite critical. I think they are still giving some room for criticism. So, and media do have a degree of independence, but it's just uh, when it comes to a really sensitive issue, there is a restraint expressed by traditional media and a very strong resistance from the, the more modern media, like social media for people who are criticizing the government. Uh, I guess that's the uh, yeah, um, right. <laughs> so it's about Prabowo, whether he has a uh, presidential ambition. Right. It's still a lot of people still think that he would run uh, again, but it, it, it's a little bit difficult to to ascertain. Really, I think uh, the last elect the. It's also a matter of resources because in the last election he used up quite a lot of resources, right? And I think if there's a resources to run again, probably he would, especially now uh, it's more established and there's a good chance. So I think it's it's, it's very difficult to say right now and just speculate. But, but at the, the answer of at this time, uh, there, there there is a significant pressure for for him to run. I think. Uh, not just his willingness to run. I think a lot of people expect him to run again. Uh, that would be, be, be my answer. Thank you. And uh, we've still got time for a few more questions. If anyone has one, uh, feel free to post it in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself. It's an open meeting, so you can connect in that way. I wonder, just getting on to, uh, you know, freedom of uh, opinion, you know, you've mentioned that there are some challenges if you're working for the government and you've got a, a, a view uh, that's not supportive and then your job could be, uh, you know, at risk. I wonder, you know, within civil society, the opposition, is that quite a safe environment to share uh, opposing views or has that dynamic changed? in recent years. Right, and I, I think what's, what's really interesting is that there, there, there is, but there's also a limit to, 
to that. So there's like a room that the government offer for people to say something, right? But there's also a limit to what extent they can express, especially in some issues that, that is being sensitive, right? And and obviously it, it depends on whether it will, you know, really undermine the, the president. Uh, and 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 I think what was really interesting is that it's not that the COVID can just you know, he needs to be subtle in, 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 in the way he was trained. And he needs to use a lot of different uh, people to, to, to do that. That's why he tends to rely on someone like David Kanye Khan to do his bidding, for example. He relied on intimidation to restrain people, uh, at least uh, in, in, in the local scale as well, right? He relies on uh, political bargaining compared to outright oppositions, right? And that's that's why uh, there is still this degree of subtlety in, 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 in politics that, that, is, that, that he needs to afford. To people. And that, that's why there's still room for people like me, for example, to say something uh, critical to, to, to government, but, but still there's a restraint. You know? There's a moment when he would set things, when, when things get really that in different ways. Oh, we've got two other questions that have come in there. So uh, one, how has the Philippines 2017 move to grant residency to stateless people with Indonesian ancestry living in southern Philippines influenced Jokowi's overtures towards diaspora Indonesians? And then another question there around the parallels between Jokowi and uh, the leadership there or uh, former leadership of Sri Lanka. Right. I think there's also a question about G20. Um, yeah, G20 is obviously a really big thing in Indonesia right now. And I think a lot of his agenda really tied to, as like I said, legacy building. Um, and he really tried to highlight that issue. And, and not only about that, for example, his visit to Ukraine and his visit to uh, his meeting with uh, with Putin in, in Moscow, for example, also highlight this imperative of domestic agenda. And um, particularly in that visit to Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, with regards to rising food prices, because Indonesia was affected quite a lot by rising food prices. And it really shows how foreign policy really connected to uh, Domestic politics, right? And, and, and in Indonesia, he was quite criticized for rising, like uh, cooking oil. Basically. And it was all affected by what happened, right? And that's, that's, that's why I think G20 was still using that frame, using that uh, domestic political frame in order to make sure that he can uh, impose some sort of political stability and he can make sure that he, he can focus on. What he really wants, which is to move the capital and to focus his priorities on, 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 on the moving of, of the capital. So, yeah, I think uh, it's very difficult to see uh, the kind of formal, like to predecessor Yudhoyono, who is quite willing to do a foreign policy for foreign policy sake, uh, regional building of some sort, because the COVID tends to be quite uh, domestic politics in, in, in this uh, output. I guess. Um, the Philippines. Right. Um, I think with, uh, the, 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 the questions about the Philippines still probably connected to um, these questions of domestic politics. And I think a lot of the policy, even with the Pacific, for example, really tied to making sure that domestic political agenda remains in check and making sure that, you know, uh, there, there won't be some sort of black swan coming that could undermine his or tarnish his legacy. We really wanted to make sure that he is this builder. He is a president who focused on uh, infrastructure building and not known for any other thing. 
uh, I think. And, and, and I'm not really sure about, uh, because I'm not an expert in Sri Lanka, so I can't really uh, <laughs> make a comparative assessment with uh, between Jokowi and, and, uh, and leaders in Sri Lanka. I don't think I'm equipped for that, so I'm going to stay uh, from that question. Uh, We've got a question there from Luis around uh, do people have uh, so, access? This is a really interesting thing because uh, I was stuck for two years in in the park in, in in Canberra, and then I returned early this year in Jakarta, and then found out actually government have been trying to impose a lot more restrictions in the internet. It's not as easy to uh, there's a lot more walls. You know, like I, I'm not. Comparing it with Chinese, uh, you know, internet great wall, but there is more imposition of trying to to assert more control. And I think what was really quite interesting was there's this two movement from the Bowie, especially since the pandemic happened, to make everyone or everything to be a bit more connected, right? So people to use or rely a lot more in the internet from e-money to uh, you know, like using internet for public uh, complain and everything. So there is that kind of, uh, he is trying to make everything basically electronic. But with, with more uh, control over internet, he is trying to restrict quite a lot of uh, freedom in the internet as well. It is, it is more difficult for people to access something. There's more like, it's easier for, for government to send for uh, certain content, I think. Um, uh, I think it will, because this is fairly new, as we go into 2024 election, that's when we, we see the, the, the extent to which he's able to uh, control the internet, right? With, with the, the infrastructure that he has set up in place. Um, and obviously, with the uh, what what has happened so far, that that we can see the evidence of is mostly centering around government people not being able to fully express their their thoughts in uh, in in social media, and there are quite a lot of them. Because a lot of people are working for the, uh, for for government or local government, right? And uh, and and this is and this limits quite a lot. Their room for uh, expressing their opinion. Um, how I can see. Right, and and when you when you said about, I mean, obviously, people participation is always a core to democracy, right? But then in this case, because uh, it tied back to Bermuda or student, because they organize themselves quite a lot with social media and they leverage social media quite a lot as a tool to criticize or to mobilized against the government, it, it, it also create that kind of dilemma where it restrict their room to fully able to uh, you know, express their opinion when, 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 uh, when the internet could uh, be in control like that. But I think, yeah, it, it's not as bad as different countries, to be honest. It's still subtle with the way the police or government right now control, exercise control and restraint. Yeah, that's it. Um. Very good. Well, that was the last of the questions. So I think what I might do is just uh, a vote of thanks uh, for your time today, Amir. And it's been uh, fascinating to hear from you. And, uh, you know, Indonesia being the world's third, third largest democracy, it's been uh, useful to get your insights into situation there at the moment in the leadership of uh, Chikawi and uh, yeah I'm sure everyone uh, on the line from the Institute and the Asia Forum uh, very much appreciated your time and your insights so thank you very much for joining with us and uh, be good to uh, hear from you again in the future as uh, the uh, elections uh, develop and uh, Indonesia and as things progress but thank you very much for your time and for everyone for joining 
for your questions. Have a good uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.